where we are on that. And the last thing I'll say is that on Thursday, we'll still have a scheduled meeting. The reason that's still on the schedule is on the hope that we'll get the green light on the Act 173 delay, in which case we would then uh, go through that with Jim on Thursday and potentially vote that out. Um, mm -hmm. Jim, do you, do you have any- uh, Senator sen Baruch, can I interrupt? I'm sorry, it's Peggy, we're live now. Thank you, Peggy. Um, Jim, do you have any sense of where they are on the Act 173 stuff? Yeah, they took, uh, I walked them through your language on Thursday, and then there's some changes they wanted to see for today, which I walked them through, and the friendly changes to what you've done. Um, but I think that'll be ready for you Thursday if you want me to walk through yeah. that bill with you. Yeah. That, that would be great. So, uh, Ruth, I think you heard, you just had your video off. Um, so we will meet on Thursday. We'll go through the Acts 173 language potentially take a vote. That might be a relatively short meeting, um, but that would be good at least to get something moving. Corey, did I see your hand? Yeah, <clears throat> and this might just be a semantics thing. I still think we should pass our language and let the house own it. I yeah. mean, if, if there's gonna come to that point that they're not gonna come to us with a reasonable proposal, I don't want them to say the whole legislature sat on their hands well, yeah. and I think we're sending them a more than fair enough proposal. I, I see nods. I, yeah. I feel I similarly. I, there's my heart in my head. My, my heart agrees with you in talking with leadership about it. Tim is pretty clear that he wants to work collaboratively only at this point. We may get to a point this session where, um, you know, we do more like the normal run of things where we just send stuff at them, they send stuff at them. I wouldn't put out of the realm of possibilities that we conference later on over Zoom. Um, that could happen, but right now we're still in this, uh, you know, zone of unanimity. So uh, we're not getting rid of the language. It's effectively on our wall and they may change their minds, but we'll see. Uh, so Debbie. One, one, one last quick question. Yep the process so did we um i think we we voted to allow joint rules to i mean they have to approve a committee to vote something and they already did yeah oh did so, they they we could vote on the we could do what senator parent suggests but yep yeah i uh i went to them uh last week for permission got permission to vote both of these out but i had promised on a call with Mitzi and uh, the speaker and the pro tem and uh, Kate Webb and myself that we wouldn't vote something out if they were uh, against it at this point. So that's that's kind of where we are. So yes, Ruth. Um, just a quick question. Are, are we gonna have time at the end of the meeting to talk about next steps? If so, I'll hold off because I don't want to keep our witnesses next, waiting. Next steps for our committee or on that language? For our committee, just yeah. more broadly. Yeah, we'll, I'll try to reserve 10 minutes at the end and and, and we'll, because we have a lot of witnesses today. Right, exactly. We'll, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, sounds good. So uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us and for sitting through that bit of boring uh, process. Um, I wanted to, if I could, turn it over very briefly to Senator Perchlick. This uh, session was his idea and a good one to follow up on uh, continuity of learning plans, specifically with reference to online and the efficacy of that, how it could be improved, how it's working. Um, but I'll, I'll let Senator Perchlick explain his thinking. Thank you. Mr. Chair, yeah, that, I mean, that was pretty well said. I, I, I want to get give time to the witnesses so I won't go on. But yeah, I was hearing from teachers and parents and students uh, about the difficulty. And so the question was raised, like, is is this the way it has to be? Can, are there other options that we might look at uh, for, the, for the last few weeks of the year or last four weeks of the year? We, there was a claim or a proposal to close school I think the committee members all agreed that that wouldn't be a good idea, but could there be something else that could be done 
uh, instead of, of just trying to muscle through a, this difficult remote learning. So we reached out to other folks and, and here we have them today. Very good. So um, I know that uh, Heather Boucher from AOE has a hard stop at 2.30. Actually, so, I'm, I'm a little okay now. I have a you? few more minutes now. Mm -hmm. that's, all, that's all right, you're, you're first on the list anyway. Oh, great, okay. So uh, please, any, anywhere you'd like to pick up on that general discussion. Sure, uh, just for the record, Dr. Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Education. I'm actually going to uh, co-testify with uh, Jessica Carolis, who's our Division Director for Student Pathways and who I believe the committee knows quite well. Uh, I thought I would just uh, start with just um, a couple of dates to remind the committee about that, just to set the table about the time frame we're talking about. So it was only March 13th that the state of emergency for Vermont was declared. On March 15th, uh, not much more than a month ago, uh, there was a directive, the initial directive closing schools, um, also require meal provision at time child care for essential workers. And uh, we focused at that time on maintenance of education, which really wasn't about new learning. It was really just to court, sort of keep students stable, not that they sort of fall backwards in terms of learning, but not also uh, be focused on teaching them new material. And schools were also, systems were also responsible for um, starting a plan to learning what had to have extended dismissal beyond eight six, given the health um, emergency. Um, on March 17th and March 24th, there were new directives, um, closing childcare and then the full stay home, stay safe directive. And on March 26th, uh, the Agency of Education put out guidance um, consistent with um, the governor's directive around that time um, that was then focusing on uh, students or schools, excuse me, and education systems really focusing on and being prepared for remote learning um, after April 6th. So um, that just gives you a little bit of a timeline, and I apologize, uh, I'm not able to share so much more to the side of at my notes here. <laughs> Uh, that gives you a little bit of the timeline about um, where we were. So uh, our guidance said that uh, if uh, schools and districts or who actually was responsible for putting forth these plans, if they got uh, their plan into the agency by the 8th of April, we would be able to give them some feedback on that before the April 13th deadline set by the governor. And then we actually went ahead as an agency and said, you know, said, let's just make sure your final implementation plan is in our hands by tomorrow, which is the 22nd. And um, so this past week, uh, or half of our districts, I would say, had been uh, the real implementation of learning. And the reason I'm saying half of our districts is because we're actually in spring break. So half of our districts are currently on spring break uh, this week, half were last week. Hopefully that makes sense to folks, mm -hmm. but typically is how um, our, our system runs um, half and half around um, spring break in particular. Uh, we have as an agency provided several um, guidance documents about what remote learning uh, looks like in best practice, um, some uh, principles, some essential elements that that was how we actually reviewed uh, each, each LEA's plan. Um, we have worked closely, I would say, with VSA, VPA, and NEA. Uh, we did have um, a miscommunication, a misinterpretation of one of our deadlines, and we weren't able to get initial feedback from NEA on our tool. But I think we've been working together on um, some of the concerns, as I said, that uh, NEA had brought up about educator voice in the process. We can talk a little bit more about that to um, a real central aspect of the continuity of learning plan is, um, is communication. And it isn't just communication from school to home, it's actually uh, communication within the education system, meaning leadership, teachers, um, staff. Um, so I think um, 
And then, as I said, the final sort of, you know, final, final continuity of learning plans are due tomorrow. We are pretty much set. Jess can talk a little bit much, a little bit more about the details of um, our publics. Uh, we also had um, a system in place that was the same system, but just with a different team at the agency for our independent schools. So if you will recall, the governor's directive said basically all schools. Um, the hardline interpretation of that was indeed all schools, including parochial schools, including any school that existed in Vermont. Um, we There was a fair amount of confusion, understandably, about that, because when it comes down to it, as a state agency, we don't really have any authority or responsibility over um, schools that are actually not um, uh, using or receiving public dollars. Um, so we had a couple of moments where we were working together uh, with the Independent Schools Association to help figure out best ways forward. I'm happy to say that I think we're all on the same page. Um, and uh, that has gone relatively smoothly in the past uh, couple of weeks. Uh, I will have some data on that, but our team is still uh, working their way through because as you might imagine, they got um, almost, I would say close to double the number of continuity of learning plans uh, than the usual number of independent schools we work with <laughs> because all of the independent schools, many of the parochial schools, a lot of the independent schools that are not usually um, doing a lot of work with us put forth the continuity of learning plans. And a lot of, frankly, a lot of um, both our, our public LEAs and the independent schools were very excited about doing this because they wanted to actually showcase some of the cool ideas they had, the work they were doing. So um, as Senator Bruce was saying before the official start of the meeting, um, it has gone um, relatively smoothly, um, all things considered, um, given the fact that we we are in um, a, a pandemic and um, you know a health crisis. So that's what I wanted to say. And then if folks have questions for me, I'm happy to take them. And then Jess has um, additional information to share. I, I can't hear you, Senator Bruce. I Why don't we <laughs> uh, go to Jess before we take questions? And Perfect. that way we'll get all of AOE's presentation out. Uh, Jess, do you have material you'd like to add? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Jesse Carolus, Division Director at the Agency of Education. Happy to uh, see you all. I have turned off my video um, in an effort to stay connected to this, um, this Zoom. Uh, just, I guess, to give you some uh, broad sort of high-level statistics, uh, as far as the total uh, public SUs, SDs, a, a total of 87 plans have been reviewed. That's inclusive of resubmissions based on feedback. Uh, happy to say that 52 out of 53 have submitted and um, the remaining outstanding district is, is Dresden as we're working out how they're communicating to, in both New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, a total of 40 SUs, SDs have met uh, all 11 essential elements. So we only have uh, 12 outstanding resubmissions and as Deputy Boucher, indicated there's a, a lot of folks who are on vacation right now, understandably. Um, I, I'm happy to say that uh, we had pretty quick turnaround with the 34 uh, plans that required resubmitting, um, that the majority of them were turned around within one day. Um, only a few, uh, the, the max number of days to turn around was three days and I would uh, blame myself for that in uh, crossing a, a weekend and engaging in what I'm calling Operation Stay Married as we uh, <laughs> manage uh, working from home together. Um, the greatest frequency of unmet elements um, in the plans uh, can really fall into three categories. The first was planning for teacher illness um, at 63% of the uh, returned uh, plans uh, had to address that planning for teacher illness. 53%, uh, there was no evaluation plan uh, of the continuity of learning uh, indicated. And then at 38%, uh, FERPA and equitable access issues just needed to be clarified. Now, just to be clear, uh, a lot of this, as soon as feedback was provided, it, it clearly was an issue of folks not knowing how to speak to it. Um, and there were certainly some 
situations where it was hard to access linked documents. And so it was just a matter of downloading and resubmitting. The lowest incidence of return of continuity of learning plans were around communications and around um, professional learning and the provision of FAPE. And the reason I just sort of give you those sort of broad statistics is I, I think it really demonstrated how um, focused SUs and SDs were on ensuring uh, the provision of FAPE for uh, some of our most vulnerable learners. The fact that they really prioritize communicating to families, to students uh, within their own systems and that they we're already focused on planning for the future and providing professional learning as folks are adjusting to this remote learning environment. Um, I, I would say that the, the concerns, if, if I'm reading correctly, and, and I, I think I would just maybe open it up for questions, but if the concern is around uh, remote learning with a, a priority on online or digital learning, uh, I would want to just point out that we have, uh, we really instituted early on this effort to partner with PBS to provide alternate means by which we can not only serve our youngest learners pre-K to five, but also those households that we know do not have, they either have low or no internet access. And after this uh, testimony, I'm meeting with VPR to continue to extend pathways into families' homes to ensure that we can design uh, learning opportunities and support educators and systems as they're trying to reach every learner in the state. Um, I think actually I'll just I'll pause there and just say maybe the rest of the time might be best served by answering questions. Let, let me just ask about that last point. I, I think that's very innovative. Um, can you just give us a flavor of what that will possibly look like the PBS VPR pathways? Yes, and, and I'll make sure to send along to, to Jeannie um, the link to our continuity of learning webpage that we developed. That's where um, the landing page for our PBS and our uh, Vermont Virtual Learning Consortium uh, links live. We have an internal sprint team at the agency that meets twice a week with the PBS team where we design um, learning activities and uh, additional support uh, for educators where we get about a week's advance notice of programming and it is pre-K to 12. Uh, there's a set schedule that we are able to pre-release to educators with uh, those support documents activities and all of the material, all of the media and programming is actually aligned to standards. Um, we we're able to sort of adopt what the Los Angeles Unified Union School District, uh, they actually own a PBS channel. That's not how we roll in Vermont, but uh, it's LA, understandably. But we actually were able to adopt a, a lot of their programming so that we could focus our efforts on those additional support documents for, um, not only for educators, by the way, but also for parents. So we're hoping that we could model something similar, probably not at such a, a large scale, because we have three channels now in the state uh, running this programming, but we're hoping to do something similar for radio. That sounds fantastic. Um, committee questions for either Dr. Boucher or Jessica Carlos. Andrew. Um, maybe we'll hear this from the other witnesses, so we we can maybe just hear hear from them. But I guess my my concern is that I think AOE what they've done is is good work to try to do this continuation of, of the learning of the content that was gonna be made this semester. I just wonder if there's a evaluation kind of as we go, if the kind of cost and stress and uh, mental uh, anguish from, from the people I'm talking to is worth the benefit. Like that kind of gets to the efficacy of this. Like, I, I think, you're you're doing like you like you mentioned at the beginning, given the time frame and the pandemic and everything. Uh, I have no complaints there. I just want to see if if there's thinking at all from the agency about is this the best thing for everybody, or is there is there is there a time where we where we evaluate as we're going and say okay for the last bit we're not gonna we're gonna try to back off on the academics and focus on something else. Or just wanted to know if there was any of that kind of evaluation going on. Yeah, uh, I can uh, take the first uh, whack at that, and then um, I'll let Jess uh, 
add anything if she'd like to. So um, first, I would actually note and make sure that the committee is aware of that um, the federal government is requiring us to um, engage in a system of continuity of learning that has come directly from USDOE. So if we don't, if we if we chose to, um, you know, just kind of say we're not really going to do any continuity of learning, and I'm not sure that's what you're saying, um, we would actually jeopardize our federal dollars. Um, and there have been significant supports um, through the um, CCSSO, which is a school organization, to help out continuity of learning because of requirements um, from the federal government. And I, I think those are well intentioned because I think the deepest fear we all have is that, you know, we know that there's already a summer melt that happens with regular school. And so if we back everything off, we're only going to be in a, a much deeper rut in terms of our gaps that we usually face, um, we usually find. Having said that, um, as I said earlier, again, before um, testimony formally took place, I think we are certainly of an empathetic mindset and we all need to be, um, understanding and aware of the, the load that we're requiring of both students and families. And so I think um, we have tried our best to actually provide guidance that would, um, following what other states are doing and what best practice suggests, if, if followed would make it reasonable, at least somewhat reasonable, that students could still learn whether that's being um, followed to a T at the local level is, um, you know, something I think that we can talk about and that's, that's up for debate. I do think as a state, as a state agency and as a state, we have an obligation to, um, to not allow um, a complete backslide in terms of um, learning. I think we'd be in a different position if we were talking only about um, one month left of a school year versus the entire last third of a school year, which is is really when you think about it, what what we're talking about, um, all told. Um, those are the pieces I think I would say, Jess, not sure you would want to jump in on anything. Um, maybe some of the guidance, for instance, that um, might help address um, Senator Perchlick's concerns. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think it is actually a really a legitimate question to ask. And uh -huh. I would say that the first thing that we're we're trying to reinforce, um, but understanding that um, the authority is, is going to sort of live at the, the local level is that less absolutely is more. Um, that this is not to replicate the school day within the boundaries of the school building and just move it online. Uh, I think all research, all guidance, scans of other state education agency uh, task force and uh, documentation all indicates that that's not what's to happen. And, and we actually, the MIT just came out with a report in which some of our, our work is also within that, is we are completely in line with supporting locals and thinking about how do you maintain continued learning, new learning, while also understanding that it's not going to be uh, status quo what we were doing before. So things such as requiring, and this was part of the continuity of learning plan template, is what are those critical proficiencies to keep students engaged, to keep them learning, to uh, provide a space? And, and particularly, I, you know, I'm thinking about our rising seniors and our graduating seniors, and that I'm not sure if it's okay to, to just sort of say, no more school, while also understanding the stressors. I think as far as sort of evaluating the effectiveness, one of the really great things and good fortune for the agency is that we've been able to continue to, to partner with our colleagues, many of whom are on the call, you know, and talking with Don and talking with Mike and, uh, and looking at a lot of the work that the Tarrant Institute has put out to sort of uh, hear back, what are those needs? We know that there are educators who are feeling at breaking point because they are you know, uh, essentially attempting to do two to three jobs. And we know that that is not realistic. And so how can we continue to refine the guidance that we put out um, as we know that when, when folks are traumatized, when folks are stressed, even the intent of what's put out can be um, confused or misunderstood. And so it's important for us to continue to think about how we can communicate guidance in a way that 
people who are under significant stress and systems that are under stress can hear what it is that we're uh, trying to say and that we can hear from them about what they need. And then I think finally, when I had shared some of the, the numbers about why plans may have been um, asked for refinement, that 53% in which there wasn't um, adequate information about an evaluation plan, that was, that was a non-negotiable within that continuity of learning planning tool is to um, require systems to monitor and evaluate implementation of continuity of learning. And that's where that communication about hearing back from parents about what they might be experiencing, hearing back from teachers about the, the load and demand and stress that they may be under, um, hearing back from students about what they need, all should be taken into the calculus and that folks should see these not as static documents, but as living documents that are refined over time, particularly because we know that everything that we're doing now is preparing us for an eventual reopening and reentry. And that that is probably where the most intense work is going to happen. And we wanna make sure that we are not asking people to sustain and maintain a pace that is completely unrealistic. And you know, I, I think that Don has shared some really uh, relevant and important information about the demands that, that educators are under, but I think the same thing is happening with our systems, with our building leaders and with our, our central office leaders. Okay, thank you. Um, Corey. One question that's come up from a handful of my constituents and I just kind of, I don't really need a response here, but want to get on the radar with this discussion is um, some parents were saying, and it makes sense at some level that we should be developing a plan. So going forward, we shouldn't even be seeing snow days in Vermont in the sense that if, if we should start to develop a plan where we have a day canceled in the building and then teachers have a lesson to go right to and count that towards student learning. So I, I think um, when this is all said and done, it makes sense to have a conversation what we learned, what was effective. And this could be a, a, a situation with COVID that goes on for some time while we're still trying to get to herd immunity. So, um, but I think there are opportunities and, and lessons to be learned here to stop other things that impact education in the state more traditionally. Yeah, uh, I would just respond, um, Senator Perrin. It's actually an, an interesting idea. And um, in a few other states, I know that um, pre-COVID, they do, they actually preserve snow days as, as teaching days because they're, they're prepared to send home backpacks, usually with younger grade students that actually have educational materials that can be done at home. And so it allows them to actually preserve uh, based on whatever that state's um, rules and regulations are, allows them to preserve some flexibility in their overall calendar. Um, but certainly the educational benefits to students are of paramount importance with that as well, because it, again, um, it helps them. And, and often these are not, um, these are more particularly, like I said, with younger grades and they're more focused on um, staying healthy and engaged, more sort of um, games focused than a strong academic component. Nonetheless, they meet the criteria. It's a good, it's a good idea. So uh, let's take Ruth's question and then we'll move to uh, Don Tinney because we're, we're burning daylight. Yeah, um, I, th this is uh, sort of a question and then a comment for the rest of the um, witnesses because what I, I'm hearing from my own kids and from my, many other kids and parents is this incredible sense of loss that students are feeling. Um, about all the things that they thought they were going to be doing this year and all of the sort of markers of what it means to be a kindergartner, what it means to be a third grader, a fifth grader, an eighth grader, whatever, and especially for our, our seniors. Um, but just, I'm going to start getting teary as I think about this, because this is a common theme in my home with three kids, just all the things that our kids have lost because of this situation and how, how much sadness there is among our students. And I think that the agency and our school districts have been doing a fantastic job of doing this continuity of education um, and learning and checking in with families. And our, the teachers I know are very aware of mental health issues. And, but I guess just in general, this, how do we help our students just overcome the sadness of what they missed? <laughs> 
Yeah, um, I will take a stab at that as well, Senator Hardy. Um, and you're making me feel quite upset as well because we know that this is one of the one of the most challenging aspects of where we are. There's there's grieving to be done. Um, teachers are also grieving, um, understandably, and I hear I hear much from both sides. I think um, you hit the nail on the head, and one of the ways we're actually planning on this is that part of a substantial part of the COVID resources must go towards mental health challenges and thinking about what the new normal looks like, um, both currently and then also in terms of re-entry, because, because that will also be another transition that will, it's not like we'll suddenly open school when that happens and, and sadness and grief will go away. Like we're really gonna have a, a transformed system. And so we are already, um, at least from the agency's perspective, but I think this is a good um, question for non-agency folks too. Um, what we're helping to do is to provide, our plan is to provide um, additional resources um, and guidance around how to use those federal resources to repurpose um, uh, funds to, to address exactly this issue. As we know, we already have had um, a significant challenge in many districts and many LEAs around trauma, um, and this will only compound the issue. There will be more students who will be feeling potentially traumatized and who will need assistance from uh, designated agencies and other personnel um, in the region. And so um, it's, it's definitely a salient concern for ours and one of our top concerns, I would say. Okay, great. Um, let's go to Don Tinney. And Don, feel free to speak about anything you'd like along these lines, but I am wondering if uh, if you share um, Dr. Boucher's general sense that things have gone relatively smoothly, and if not, where the rubs are for NEA and teachers. Sure. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, for, for the record, I'm Don Tenney, high school English teacher from South Hero, uh, here in my role as president of Vermont NEA. Um, and I think that I, I also want to appreciate Jess and Heather's comments and um, and the ability to keep our lines of communication uh, open. Um, and it's it's really important in that that continues. Uh, I think there's a, a, you know a mixed array of how this has been implemented. Um, and just to, to immediately respond to Senator Hardy, um, you're absolutely right. the the degree of, of mourning um, over the losses is, certainly a part of our students' lives as well as, as our educators. One of the things that we're doing at Vermont NEA is um, we're uh, setting up, we have a phone call on Wednesday with Dave Melnick of NFI, and we'll be providing some webinars um, directed to social emotional learning and, and trauma sensitive practices. So we definitely see that as, as a real need. So, um, but here, you know, I just, you know, we, we can't say enough about our educators. Uh, our board of directors could not be any prouder of the Herculean efforts that they have demonstrated uh, in, in all kinds of ways, doing whatever is necessary to maintain a sense of normalcy for students and their families, whether it's preparing, you know, and delivering meals to teaching classes in a whole new way. Uh, they really have met the challenges I think in part what has happened in this time is that they have really demonstrated how valuable the services that our public schools provide uh, happen to be. Um, you'll hear from two practitioners who are currently in the field, so I'll defer to them to provide specific details um, and simply offer a few general observations. I think one of the things that we're learning, and this is to, um, the initial reason for this, is that distance learning is much more complicated and much more challenging than almost anyone could have predicted. Um, it looks nothing like the commercials for the University of Phoenix or Southern New Hampshire University. Um, and <clears throat> we are, we're hearing about the varying degrees of success with the implementation of the continuity of learning plans. Process is going most smoothly in districts where there has been a high degree of collaboration amongst administrators, curriculum directors, teachers, and support staff. In districts that did not heed the governor's call for all parties to work together in his March 27th press conference uh, and try to implement plans not created co collaboratively, 
uh, the process has not gone all that smoothly. Uh, in talking with my counterparts across the nation, I know that distance learning has presented similar challenges in, in every state. So while this is a generalization, I think it is an accurate observation to say that many of our plans are overly ambitious with regard to academic expectations. Um, with the best of intentions and an abundance of goodwill, uh, our educators are simply trying to do too much within the confines of distance learning. I noted that EdSurge, which is a new service our, owned by the International Society of Technology and Education recently posted an article about the approach China took in implementing distance learning. And in February, their Ministry of Education prohibited educators from introducing new material until the start of the next semester. Uh, the article also pointed out that paying close attention to the social and emotional needs of students, teachers, and families is critical to building an environment that supports learning. While no one is proposing an abandonment of academic standards, I do think we need to revise some of our plans to make sure the delivery of instruction is sustainable over time. And as we move forward, making adjustments and revisions to the continuity of learning plans at the local level, we need to make sure that our members are at the table to provide feedback and ideas in the process. As I've mentioned in previous testimony to your committee, the federal Every Student Succeeds Act, Act requires that educators be involved with the development of school improvement plans. So I maintain that we should follow the spirit of that law and making sure that educators have their voices heard in this process. And Heather's already addressed that issue and I greatly appreciate that. Uh, the labor management collaboration will be crucial as we have as we move forward in planning for the, the re-entry of students to our school buildings. Uh, one, of, one of their, um, out of their commitment to their students, our members are working harder than ever implementing distance learning while keeping student health and safety at their, as their top priority. And while the, the daily schedules during the regular school year provide our students and educators with an assuring routine, they also provide boundaries around the time everyone invests in teaching and learning. I've included in um, the testimony that's been posted a narrative from one of my colleagues I've known for over 20 years, uh, which explains how it's becoming a 24 seven responsibility. And I won't read that now, but it's something you could refer to. We have to get away from this 24 seven mentality that is you know, um, created by the online world, right? But first and foremost, our, our educators want to maintain the human connection with their students and then do the best they can to deliver academic instruction. It's the human side of this experience that Senator Hardy addressed um, is in, it's incredibly important. A great source of stress and anxiety for our teachers is when they can't connect with their students. Students who lack internet access are at a distinct disadvantage in today's world. The digital divide between children of poverty and children of privilege is only one glaring example of the socioeconomic disparities that have been accentuated by this pandemic. Now is the time for all of us to reflect upon our entire system and uncover the blind spots of privilege and poverty in our schools. We all nod to the fact that we have students who qualify for free and reduced meals in our schools, but have we really examined the impact of poverty on the lives of our students? Have we understood the perspective of our students and their families who live in poverty? When we return to our classrooms, how will we counteract the beliefs amongst our students in poverty that they are inferior to their wealthier peers? The stakes for society are high and we must face the historic and contemporary disparities in power, privilege, and access, which have been presented to us in very concrete ways in the last month. Addressing the socioeconomic disparity is only one of many factors we need to be considering as we plan for the reopening of our classrooms. Educators, administrators, families, and community members 
need to gather together to begin thinking about how we will most effectively meet the needs of our students in the next few months and years. How will we administer high quality formative assessments to determine what types of compensatory education is needed? How do we make sure that every school is a trauma sensitive school and has the necessary counseling services in place? We can't allow ourselves to be so overwhelmed by immediate demands that we ignore the required planning for what's next. We have much work to do. Thank you. Don, would you like to have your uh, two teachers uh, present and then we'll ask questions of the three of you? Absolutely, they, they know a whole lot more than I do. Uh, and, and in any order you like? That's up to you, Chairman. Uh, well, I have Mike McGrath. Uh, oh, Mike's or... not one of mine. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, I have. I, I would be happy to have him come back into the fold, but. <laughs> I have uh, Michael Campbell. Michael Campbell. Mike, would you like to go? Yes, sure. Um, I have um, prepared remarks, um, and I want to be, I want to be cautious of your time. If this is a two to three meeting. Um, my remarks are about, I've read them three times or six minutes. Um, I, I don't want to. Um, that's, that's fine. We are actually running till 3.30. So. Okay. I just want to be respectful of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Mike Campbell. I first like to thank Senator Baruth and uh, Senator Perchuk uh, for offering us this opportunity. And a special shout out, of course, to Senator Parent, who's our, our region's representative or senator. Uh, since 1999, I have been a social studies teacher at Bellas Free Academy in St. Albans, and I've been a contributing member of the virtual high school community since 2012. As part of my full teaching load, I facilitate VHS honors psychology course and also a VHS uh, sociology course. In exchange, this brings um, 25 BFA student seats for nearly 200 courses at VHS. I continued with their professional development program and I've completed a certificate of online education through Plymouth State University. I've then been asked to teach two VHS graduate PD courses and I currently help facilitate a graduate level uh, OTM online teaching methodology for new VHS teachers from all over the globe. Additional VHS positions that I hold are uh, as faculty advisor where new VHS teachers get support in their first online semester. And finally, I fulfilled a two-year position as VHS advisory board member. My BFA classroom teaching methodology is a blended model where I facilitate a hybrid uh, between traditional practices and online practices. Therefore, I fully support online education. You might expect me to follow with a long list of why the response to COVID-19 closure has been a boon. Certainly there are some empowering success stories, but I would also like to sound a note of caution in multiple areas. I fully recognize the emergency nature of the situation and I celebrate all the successes that are achieved. There is no desire nor intent to point a finger of blame at any part of this response, but I think we're here for the express purpose to share what is actually happening across the state. My points come from my experience that I've shared, as well as my observation of my colleagues and my students' responses. So first, to list of some positives. Students are exposed to a new style of learning that they may never have explored without the situation. Second, Students learn to be self-motivated, to take ownership of their learning, and practice time management skills. Three, students are able to create meaningful and creative connections to curriculum when given these online resources and asked to construct various learning products. And finally, this is an excellent opportunity to explore flexible pathway models. However, here are some drawbacks and concerns. This method of learning does not fit all student learning styles and can actually frustrate learning which creates additional anxiety during a very anxious time and during an already established epidemic of anxiety. Second, this is inherently unequal where students don't have equal technology access or even online skill sets to learn effectively. Even in families with technolog technological access, there may be more need to use the home computers by all the family than what continuous learning re requires. Students can more easily Additionally, students can more easily fall through the cracks as they opt out in like a classroom environment. Next, the education system can't simply flip classroom instruction to an online format. Teachers require PD training to, proper, to properly set up, to facilitate, and to assess online curriculum. 
then there is mandated reporting. It must be considered as we uh, are doing some excellent video meeting formats. We are reaching into their personal spaces and privacy issues abound. Nothing can be more vital um, going further. Nothing can replace the vital teacher in contact um, that's critical for achievement. In my opinion, online learning is developmentally inappropriate for youngest students. In some districts, educators have not had the leadership role in the creation of the continuous learning plans. And just as we should listen to our medical experts for advice on COVID-19 policy, we must also listen to our teachers in that area of expertise as well. So those are my concerns. Statewide continuous learning plan efforts have been well-intentioned with using some of the best practices that I mentioned above. Yet in trying to be as simple as possible, they've still resulted in creating undue anxiety for students, parents, and teachers. FA has largely switched to the Google Classroom, yet teachers still offered over two pages of their own best online programs and resources. Students then must learn to navigate a myriad of excellent online quiz systems, resources where each of these takes time to sign up for and master. You all know that even simple technology can be inconsistent, especially when it's new, or you have spotty connectivity, or you're simply not thinking straight due to the anxiety of, of the world. Unfortunately, I have too many examples of student breakdowns and parent confusion list here today. Students must also, um, we must always keep them as the primary focus of our work and the teachers that they rely so heavily upon come to this continual learning phase with some significant issues as well. Teachers are spending countless hours to learn new online programs, facilitate usage for struggling students, assess only a partial percentage of these students. Some students simply aren't engaged and or give up due to confusion or the lack of access. Teachers simultaneously have their own children to help educate and also provide care for during this time. As all this points to increased anxiety and potential burnout and diminished learning results. So what to do? Recognize that in short term, we may be asking too much from the whole system and inadvertently causing some damage to social and emotional health and even to learning as educators, students, and parents are cooperatively bending over backwards to try and make it work. Reflect upon the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic where it came in three distinct waves. We have some time to get a PD to our teachers for the fall. We have some time uh, to more deeply, deeply simplify and coordinate basic district stat strategies. We can even practice this with our students in the fall. Prioritize, um, the next um, bullet is prioritize statement internet access. Um, statewide internet access as we struggle with economic uncertainty because we owe it to our students in terms of equity. Vermont's economy boomed with full electric asset access, then integration uh, I-89 of I-89 and I-91, it also boomed, and it will also boom with full broadband access. And finally, make sure that district by district educators' voice is not only present, but leads the planning of continuous learning plans that students receive. And I thank you for your attention to my testimony. And as always, I'm always open for answering questions and now or at a later date. Thank you. Uh, great, Stephanie Miller. Hi all, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Um, my name is Stephanie Miller. I teach uh, fifth grade at Mallets Bay School. This is my 21st year of teaching. Um, I'm actually also a resident of Georgia. So Georgia is really well represented here apparently. Um, and I have just, uh, just so you know, I also have a freshman and a senior in high school. So I get, uh, I get Senator Hardy's senior uh, issues. Um, so what I first wanted to point out is what we're doing right now is not school. If anything um, that I have learned through this experience is we are not providing for our students what we can provide for them in the building. And I have learned as a fifth grade teacher, it is not possible. The school building, the human interaction, the connection, the first thing we do as a teacher is we teach them that they are safe, that they are that they belong. We feed them, <laughs> we'll teach, you know, we clothe them, we give them everything that they need to feel safe. And that was ripped away from them in March. And so for a good chunk of my students, they're looking for me to just sort of hang out with them. They do my assignments. Um, I will be honest, it, you, learning how to use Google Classroom was a huge undertaking, 12 hour days, um, figuring out how to teach the kids, figuring out how to use it myself. No best practice would ever say to use this system and learn it and use it with kids without learning it first. Um, but what it's really shown me is the equity issue. 
Um, there is a huge divide in what my kids are available to access right now. And that divide is not just in what they have for technology or internet, it's what they are emotionally able to access. They have parents who have been laid off. They have parents who are in healthcare and are gone all day. Um, when I hear that we need to assess our, our students, um, I really think we're assessing their privilege. We're not assessing whether or not they learned my math lesson on decimals. We're assessing whether or not they had an adult at home who understood, who made a space for them to work, gave them quiet, offered help if I wasn't available. Um, I will say I usually have pretty good boundaries between my work world and my home world. Those are all off the table to the point that my son said to me one night, are you going to keep answering their emails or can I have some time now too? Cause he needed help. And that really is our reality that we're trying so hard to be there for them when they are available to work that we have spent too much time in front of a computer screen. Um, many of my colleagues are talking about the physical aspects. Um, our eyeballs are bleeding, um, our backs hurt. We don't spend the day stationary. So this has been really difficult for us um, and difficult for the kids. They want to be with their friends. Um, they are all mourning the loss. I really do look at the fact that I am right now teaching 23 children in trauma. And how you teach children in trauma is very different than how you teach children when they are available and ready to learn. The amount that you can teach them is different. And um, the expectation of being assessed um, is really hard. Kids are getting negative feedback about their availability during a time when they're just not emotionally able to be there. Um, there is a large group of them that are mourning the loss of everything that made them feel connected, that made them feel successful, whether it was the sports team, whether it was the final concert of the year, whether it was, um, you know, getting to play. I know the Allstate Band Festival was canceled. Those are things that kids do that they feel successful in that translate to them being able to do math, to, to access their reading. And we don't have any of that right now. And as teachers, our number one goal right now is to help kids still feel connected so that they can feel safe. But what we're doing right now, it's not school. And if this solidified anything for me, probably all the way up through, you know, fifth to eighth grade, it, it will never be appropriate for us to be doing online learning. Kids need teachers. Their parents don't have that access to the knowledge. And this has highlighted this. You know, you hear about, oh, I didn't learn math that way. Um, some of them are living with their grandparents and they're really saying, I didn't learn math that way. Um, and it has shown me the divide. The divide is bigger. What I also know is that my teachers and I are talking about what we need to do in the fall, what we need to do when we come back. We know that it's it's going to be different. We know we're going to have to take and teach a little bit of what was before and move those kids forward. And we're going to have to try to figure out a way eventually to get a year and, you know, a little bit and of, of extra work in one year to catch them up over time. And that's going to take, in some cases, two to three years. But this has definitely showed the divide. It is, we are right now, we are assessing privilege. We are not assessing what children know. Thank you. I, I, uh, I appreciate the bluntness of that because it's, it's something we should all take away. We've, uh, you know, all of us run for a reelection every two years. I can't remember a reelection campaign going back 20 years that didn't talk about the need to wire up the state with broadband. Uh, and we have not done it, not done it, not done it. I think this is finally uh, a moment where we might be able to complete that task, given that we have the money coming from the federal government that can be applied to it um, in the same way that we did following the crash in 2008. Um, so questions for Don Tenney or either of the two professionals that um, just offered their insights. Uh, Senator Ingram. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I think Don touched on this, but I'm, I was wondering if you have been aware of um, either other states or Don, as you mentioned, other countries where um, you felt like they were, you know, they had struck that right balance um, between, you know, what, what can be done remotely and what needs to be left, um, you know, for the time when we're able to be in person again. Uh, can you may say what's a good model for us? Right. I think, and, you know, we, I meet once a week with all the other state presidents and, and we're all um, taking it one day at a time. I don't think anybody has found the, the, the answer. And, and uh, Deputy Secretary Boucher mentioned, you know, the, the federal government has this, um, this is not going to be satisfied with maintenance of learning, um, which puts us in a, in a rough spot. And I, um, you know, Stephanie spoke to this eloquently, as did Mike, but um, the idea that kids can independ essentially independently acquire new, new knowledge, um, cover new material um, is, I think, is just false because of the need for that teacher to be with students shoulder to shoulder. Um, so I, I think to answer your question, no, I don't have, I don't have um, examples of where it's done well. And I certainly would not want to go to the Chinese model of, of the authoritarian thou, sh you know, thou are prohibited. My personal opinion is that we should be focused on the joy of learning um, and fundamental literacy skills that are not, um, you know, terribly elaborate in terms of requirements of all kinds of different materials, et cetera. And I'll defer to Mike and Stephanie. Okay, um, not seeing any any hand. Other questions? Okay, then why don't we move to um, Mike McRae. Thanks everybody for having me and thanks everyone for those comments. It resonates, it all resonates for me. Um, thanks, uh, Senator Perchlik, I think that um, you uh, put this together and gave us a chance to connect with the, with all of you. And uh, just really grateful to all of my fellow Vermonters for everything that you're doing, whether it's, you know, figuring out how to hold Senate Ed committees um, or, uh, you know, teach remotely um, and every, all the problem solving. I'm just really proud of our state. Um, nothing's perfect, but I've seen a lot of people rise to the occasion, including, including you folks. So thank you. Uh, I, I want to start off by saying that uh, I'm going to echo a fair bit of what you've already heard, and I'll try to move into some new territory, but um, we're not doing continuity of learning. We're doing continuity of learning in crisis, and those are two very different things, and I think that that's important um, to just frame everything because uh, it's not as if, uh, you know, a student uh, said, you know what, I think I'm going to try a class online, which we have students do that all the time, um, and they, you know, checked out a computer from the library or they had one at home or something and they're gonna you know be connected to the the flexible pathways teachers that's overseeing online work and they're gonna take one class online that's that's not what we're doing um so even the best practices as far as uh you know distance ed go i, I didn't say for the record my name is mike mcgrath i work for uh, uh as the assistant executive director for the vermont principal association I've worked in Franklin County as a school counselor, middle school principal, and most recently as a high school principal in Montpelier. Um, so we're, the best practices for distance ed um, really don't apply um, in this case. We're in unprecedented territory, not only in Vermont, but all over the country and all over the world. There's no, we have, no one has done this before. Even in when, times when we've been away from school for long periods of time, uh, we didn't have the tools that we have now to be able to hold this kind of meeting right now. So that we're in totally un uncharted territory. And I think it's important to, to recognize that, uh, you know, things like our free and reduced lunch rates are probably way up in many places. And we're, we just don't know that. We also have, um, and this was mentioned, um, somebody already mentioned this, that, you know, sometimes students of means, students of privilege that we might on paper might show up as students of privilege uh, as far as uh, economic diversity goes are not because their parents might be um, really busy. It, maybe they're working in the hospital, maybe they're nurses, maybe um, you know, they're totally occupied as essential staff. Um, so kids that maybe normally we would think of as being privileged are not. 
So, you know, there's all kinds of nuance uh, in the challenges uh, that we're facing. I want to highlight something that the agency, with support from the, the VPA and VSA and maybe the Vermont NEA, Donald told me um, otherwise, uh, if not, uh, got some feedback on the initial cover page for the continuity of learning. Uh, they, they put out a draft to their credit. Um, they have been working around the clock. Um, I, I've been in contact with Jess a fair bit and Heather, and I know Jay, our executive director has been in touch with Dan and they have really, really worked very hard and we're very grateful. And one of their initial drafts of the continuity learning plan um, was useful and also, uh, you know, maybe missing some of the heart that you're, you've heard a, a fair bit about um, today. And uh, with some feedback, they redraft the cover letter and listed priorities. And the top three priorities, though they are not officially ranked, but they were in this order, were health and safety, equity, and relationships. And that really resonated with my constituents at the VPA. Um, they felt like that those were the things that need to be, needed to be prioritized. Um, and one, one of uh, an assistant principal in Fairhaven, uh, Jen Paquette, sent me an email and said, you know what, Mike, it's really relationships because you can't really do equity or health and safety without it. If the relationships aren't at the center of what you're doing, you're not gonna be able to connect to the kids that you're worried about for health and safety and equity. And I think that that's really uh, something that has risen to the surface is just how crucial, how essential relationships are um, for all of us as we go into isolation, that we are all connected and that schools drive relationships, not only for the school community, but you know, in large, in a large way for, for many communities in whole, um, for celebrations, uh, for getting through hard things together and for helping uh, raise our, our young people to, to be healthy contributing members of society. So I just wanna reemphasize that importance that those are our official priorities from the Agency of Education. And we don't wanna forget that. We wanna to continue to circle back to that and make sure that our other guidance and our other actions uh, match with those things. Um, so, uh, the other thing that I want to say is that uh, around access, and we know that some kids don't have access and some teachers don't have access. Um, and, you know, Senator Baruth, you mentioned like that we've been talking for 20 years about broadband. We have to do it now. We have to. It's so important for our economy. And I, I think that, it, you know, it's almost like a right in, in the modern world. So uh, I know that the USDA has some kind of uh, grant available, and I think Vermont is a really good candidate for that. I hope that, um, you know, we're doing some kind of coordinated effort to make sure that we have an application in, not to mention the stimulus money that might be connected to being able to bury some fiber optic cable, but, but let's do it. Um, it, if we're going to, people are going to realize how easily you can work from home if you do have good connection and we're going to, why not, uh, you know, say we're this beautiful, we're this beautiful state and you can live in beautiful Vermont and it, don't, it won't matter if you work for a company in California or otherwise, because you're going to have access. So there's, uh, not only that for our economy, um, but for our students. It's like, like I said, it's a dead stop for kids that don't have broadband or, or have inconsistent access. Um, even folks that do have access, we're trying to put everybody online at once. So, you know, I've got all kinds of principals that were like, well, I can't make that meeting because, you know, my daughter has geometry and we both can't be on there at the same time. So um, I think that that is, is a reality for, for both um, kids and adults. And uh, I really appreciate what Jess shared and has been working really hard at with PBS and now VPR to try to find other ways for kids to connect. And we've got schools all over the state doing, you know, sending home packets, in, including in my house. I've got a kindergartner here and the packet that's come from Miss Margo has been awesome and he loves to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, it's different uh, depending on the grade level and it is certainly not school. So uh, the other thing I want to say is uh, just underline uh, these, the, the traumatic uh, impact. Not only is everybody sort of, you know, discombobulated about their own personal safety and their own place in life, and we've got all kinds of people uh, losing jobs and, and the stress levels that go up uh, for the adults, 
But, you know, even just in, uh, in our directive, stay home, stay safe, which I much prefer to like lockdown or something like that. Uh, there's implicit bias there. And I know there's no harm intended. But the idea of staying home implies that you have a home. And the idea of staying safe is the idea that your home is safe. And that's not just not true for many of, for many of our Vermonters and many of our uh, most vulnerable Vermonters who are young folks. And so the idea of staying home in a difficult situation with increased stress and uh, limited access to resources and travel is, it, it means that our, our most at risk students, uh, that issue has been exasperated. And we really won't even know uh, what we're dealing with until we return to school. And lately I've heard uh, many, uh, many administrators talking about what it will mean to come back. And if there's a way um, to really just focus on those relationships and that community building in the first couple of weeks, or I mean, at a minimum, the first week, right? And just being prepared um, to have social work workers at the ready um, for everyone to be both mentally and uh, having a specific plan in place where you can celebrate those relationships, you can celebrate being back and do all kinds of TA activities and concentrate on those relationships and see how kids are doing and what they need. Um, it's going to be uh, a start, uh, a return to in-person school like never before. And the more that we can be prepared for that, um, the better. Okay, I should probably stop yep. you there, Mike. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, you want me to go for another hour or two, no problem. <laughs> if, if we had time, I would be happy to. Um, thank you very much. I do wanna make sure we get to our other two witnesses. Um, so let's move uh, to John Downs from the Tarrant Institute. Thoughts, thoughts on any of these uh, topics, John? Thank you. Uh, and I do have uh, a bit to say, but let me yield to my uh, colleague, James. We'll be presenting the same uh, testimony. Oh, good. Oh, I think you're still muted, James. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, and uh, John to uh, discuss more of a long-term um, issue, which is not only what we're doing right now in the time of crisis, but what will, what will we do when we return in the fall, whether it's remote or whether it's face-to-face. -face. And John uh, is going to read our statement that we put together to kind of respond to it. And we're both willing to go ahead and um, answer any questions that you may have. Um, again, I'm James Nagel. I am a professor at St. Michael's College. I'm also the uh, co-director of the Middle Grades Institute, which is a professional development um, organization that works with upper elementary, middle school, and high school teachers. And this summer at our um, Middle Grades Institute, we're going to be online, and we're going to be working with teachers on developing plans for the first eight weeks of school that will address the issues either remotely or face-to-face around trauma, around what we should be doing in teaching in schools for our communities and for our families and for our teachers. So I'll let John uh, read our statement and introduce himself. Thank you, James, and thank you to the committee. Uh, my name is John Downs and I'm the uh, director of the Tarrant Institute for Innovative Education at uh, the College of Education and Social Services at the University of Vermont. And for the last, uh, 13 years or so, we've been helping schools develop more engaging and meaningful learning opportunities for students. And we've done a fair bit when it, when it comes to technology integration, including much of the one-to-one -one integration work that was uh, such a big part of our lives uh, five or so years ago. Uh, as James said, we're gonna take a, a somewhat longer view uh, of this issue uh, longer at least than the kind of rest of year continuity of learning plans that folks have discussed. But the ideas certainly have implications for what can happen over the next few months. Until mass immunization educates our bodies on how to live with the virus, our families and communities and societies are living and learning through this pandemic. And our youth are learning through it as well. They will never forget this time, a time when for months they couldn't gather to play with their friends, 
when they forgot what it was like to visit their grandparents or cousins, when their baseball, sophomore, softball, and soccer seasons, their dances and proms, their worship services and holiday gatherings, their summer road trips and day camps were all canceled. When a third or more of adults in their families and communities lost their jobs, and those who had their jobs either were lucky enough to stay at home or risk their lives as essential workers. The pandemic will inform who our children are, what they believe about family, society, democracy, and the role of schools. Children will learn all this not by watching, not just by watching the adults, but also through the roles they play in addressing the challenges they and their communities will face. We have a choice in designing the response to the pandemic that allows our educational system to continue with the status quo or move in a direction that prioritizes community and the common good. For the former, it would look like doing school remotely, focused on grades, completing assignments, and achieving narrowly construed from standardized test scores. For the latter, education would instead focus on their worries and needs, their loved ones, their relationships, and the questions and concerns they have about their community, their futures in the world, in an equitable and sustainable way. Fortunately, our state's education system already prioritizes learning in and with the community. For decades, Vermont has developed policies that have focused on some of these key issues even before Vermont education was faced with COVID. In 1968, the Vermont Design for Education offered 17 statements focused on student-centered learning that school districts could implement. In 2002, High Schools on the Move recommended, and I quote, schools begin by adapting existing programs and aiming their action plans toward the 12 principles, and that high schools include entire communities in changing the secondary school experience. By engaging families, teachers, human service agencies, businesses, colleges, elementary and middle schools in their individual student pursuits, their personal aspirations, and meet high standards, a high school can help develop opportunities for learning throughout the community." End quote. And in 2013, Act 77, the Flexible Pathways Initiative, set in, mo set in motion three pillars of personalized learning. The personalized learning plans, flexible pathways in and out of school, and proficiency-based assessment. This vision of community-focused learning aligns with significant and common challenges Vermont's communities now face. Most immediately, for instance, are the significant strains on our health systems, food systems, broadband connectivity and transportation infrastructures, and most important with regard to school systems, the basic well being of our children. The strains in these systems are exhibited both in terms of how the services are provided, but also in the many jobs they create, many of which are now at risk. Addressing the systems challenges of our communities has long been a focus of educators at the forefront of personalized learning even before Act 77. When teachers take on community challenges, they see deeply engaged students in focused, coherent, and collaborative learning. They see students and community partners embrace the converging interests and passions of youth and adults, of schools and their communities. Students witness the power of tapping assets and expertise across even the most distressed communities. Students realize the authentic, real-world application of critical knowledge and transferable skills from across the disciplines, and they see parents, community members, school boards, and others awed by what young people care about and are able to accomplish in the world. I'd like to share just a few examples. The green team at Main Street, at Main Street Middle School believes that students in, of the 21st century must know and understand how issues related to climate change and sustainability will impact their economies, social, political, and geographical futures. They form teams to investigate sustainability issues and collaborate with community-based organizations that partner with them. Examples include the Main Street Middle School Trash Audit, in which students worked with Chittenden Solid Waste District to understand what and how much trash the school was creating, and then developed a recycling plan to reduce trash at the school. Middle school students at Orleans Elementary School work with Shelburne Farms Cultivating Pathways for Sustainability program to learn about the UN Global Goals for Sustainability. They use those goals to think about issues that they can address in Orleans and in the surrounding area. They decided their community most needed to seek the goals of no poverty and zero hunger. In response, students with community members planned a community dinner 
and created a school store to sell bake sale items. The money from both events was then donated to community organizations to fight poverty and hunger in the Northeast Kingdom. The iLab at Winooski High School is a technology rich space in which students have the opportunity to explore their own areas of interest, work with community experts and take ownership of their learning. Students enroll in the iLab just like any other course in middle or high school, but the curriculum is student directed and project based for students interested in investigating authentic real world issues important to them. Projects include such topics as participating in local peace and justice center, performing a Buddhist ceremony for family and friends, and creating a wellness guide for new, for new American women. These are just several of many examples from over the years and across the state. Vermont is also rich with community partners, the Community Engagement Lab, Vermont Folklife Center, Farm to School, Shelburne Farms, Veep, and many other organizations offer ready to use curriculum that engage teachers and students in community-based learning. Other organizations, including Up for Learning, Big Picture, the Middle Grades Collaborative, and the Tarrant Institute, specialize in helping educators, youth, and adults work effectively together to engage in meaningful learning. All of these examples and resources provide opportunities for engaging, focused, and coherent learning. They prioritize the transferable skills, the most critical learning outcomes for our students' future success. They generate vivid and authentic evidence of growth that community members can readily appreciate and are the purpose of personalized learning plans and proficiency-based assessment. And the folks involved in this work are already making the transition to, to the remote context we're living in with now and will likely experience into the future. A core curriculum focused on core community needs is more important now than ever. Teachers and families cannot sustain doing school remotely. The traditional school curriculum is untenable and inequitable under any circumstances. Pursued remotely, it will compound inequality to a degree that we've never experienced before. School and educational leaders need schools that more directly address community challenges if they expect taxpayers to pass budgets under such dire economic circumstances. And community members and organizations have much needed expertise and capacity to engage with schools Yet they are key to the, their, that capacity is key to expanding students' connections with caring adults, with mentors to see them through this challenging time, and partners who model for them what professional and civic participation looks like under the most challenging of circumstances. And state leadership needs education to reduce inequality, promote more prosperous life outcomes for its youth, and contribute to long-term economic and social stability. State and local leadership need ways to engage and coordinate all available resources to address the challenges of the crises in public health, the economy, and community. At his news conference yesterday, Governor Scott wondered aloud what it would look like if we seized upon this moment to invent schools we really need. For the last several weeks, schools and districts have wondered as well as they completed their continuity of learning plans. Yet for most of us, this last month has been about trauma and triage as the depth of the crisis sinks in and its horizon extends farther into the future, we transition to mapping the longer term. The cracks in our society in general and in our education system in particular are revealed more clearly than ever. The intense pressure on our systems and our families, educators, neighbors and leaders is forcing us to focus on what's most important. Focusing on what's best for our children focuses us on critical opportunities to build more resilient communities. We can, be, be, we can begin that work now by nurturing community schools focused on a core curriculum with core community needs. I thank you for the time and I welcome your questions. A, a question, James, are you also planning to speak? Uh, no, I'm not. That okay. was a joint statement. Ah, understood. Okay, and our timing is pretty good. We have just two minutes left. Any questions for uh, James Nagel or John Downs? Uh, Senator Perchley. The written, the written report. Um, so we have it for our records. We'll be contented. So, Amy, she, she'll put it on the website. That would be sure, great. Sure, we'd be happy to offer that. Senator Perchley. 
Yeah, I just want to make sure that everybody that gave testimony could, if they had it written out, to send, to send it and just thank all the mm -hmm. different witnesses for participating. If we had more time, we could have a, a longer discussion, but I just want to make sure I said thank you. Yeah, I, I think if you had to sum up the thematic that I've heard in a number of the witnesses' testimony today, it's that the this has caused us to foreground the human um, as we've moved to a kind of mechanical delivery system. Obviously, you've dropped off the human interface and the human interaction, communal and one-on-one. -on -one. And I hear everybody saying that if we move forward with any version of this, that has to be at the forefront of our thinking um, and community as uh, John Downs pointed out as well. Um, thanks so much to the witnesses. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about. And committee, I had hoped we could uh, have little discussion at the end of this session, but we've run out of time. So I've asked uh, Ruth if she minds if we move that discussion to the end of Thursday session. So I'm gonna stay on the line now with Jeannie and we'll put together an agenda for Thursday that has 173 walkthrough and discussion, potential vote, and then maybe 15 minutes to a half an hour for committee discussion about where we will um, go in the following week or two. Anything from anybody before we wrap? Okay, thanks so much. Uh, I'll see you all soon. And uh, Jeannie, if you can just hang on the line, we'll finish this uh, schedule. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bye, all.